for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm going to talk about some work that I've been doing uh, over the few year, last few years with uh, Sophie Donnet, Vincent Rivoira, and me, on hoax processes. So it's a, a sort of a new version from the one I presented last year because uh, I didn't quite like the results we had at the time. So the uh, sort of motivating example is the um, um, neural activity, neur neuronal activity. So you have some neurons and they have some spikes and what you're interested about is understanding the uh, interactions between the neurons, how a, a spike in a neuron can uh, fire another spike or on the contrary, inhibit another spike. And so they're going to model that using point processes. So just a, a sh uh, like one slide uh, uh, rem uh, recall on point processes. So point processes, you are looking at events and time of events through time. So here the, it's just through time, it's not a space point processes. And so one of the key characteristics of point processes are, are the um, conditional intensity functions. And essentially, you can look at it as the uh, sort of ex uh, expectation of the instantaneous uh, number of, fire, of uh, spikes fired at a given time, so it's one, given the past. So FT is the adapted uh, filtration, so it's essentially the past. Uh, so the most well-known uh, point process is the Poisson process, and uh, in this case, the lambda t, the, in, um, uh, the intensity function, is uh, deterministic. And so when it's constant, you have the homogeneous Poisson process, uh, but it can be non-constant. And one of the key characteristics of Poisson processes is that the intervals between times, the, uh, the, the length of the intervals between times are independent random variables. Uh, here we'd be interested in slightly more sophisticated point processes uh, and they are the hoax process. Uh, and hoax processes are defined by the fact that the, uh, so the conditional intensity function is a positive part. I mean, I go back to this story. So it's essentially a, a constant, so like a, a homogeneous Poisson process plus some uh, uh, effect uh, on the uh, here. So that H story, here is the sum of a Ti of Ht minus Ti, is the, it sort of describes the effect of the past on the new uh, probability of getting a new spike, essentially, at a given time T. So if H is positive, then it's called self-excitation processes, uh, these processes, and they are, have been used in particular to model uh, uh, seismic activities. But uh, H can be negative in some cases, and in this case, you can model inhibition. Uh, so the pass essentially prevents from a new spike or something like that. And because the intensity function has to be positive, then you take the positive part or anything, any transformation that goes from R to R plus. But typically, the positive part is the most common one. So in practice, we'll be looking at uh, general H, so it can be positive and negative. But in the theory, we'll have only the positive story, the positive H story. So, but in, uh, what we're interested about are multiple neurons, and so we have a multivariate version of what I've just described. Essentially, uh, you have uh, n neurons, and each neuron is firing spikes, so each neuron has time events, and uh, they, are inter they, have, they are not independent, in the sense that uh, the spikes fired at neuron 1 can have an influence on the following spikes for neuron 2 and neuron 3 and so on and so forth. And so for each neuron, little m, you have an intensity function, the conditional intensity function. That's the positive part, or forget about the positive part, that's the sum of something that's purely for the neuron, so the new m story, a constant, plus these interactions uh, aspects that's, uh, that come from all other neurons and the past of all other neurons. And uh, so HLMs these, uh, describe the, the excitation or the interaction of neuron L on neuron M. And it can be positive or negative, but in the theory, they will be only negative, positive. And uh, there is quite a lot of theory on these processes. And in particular, it's been proved that uh, if uh, the matrix I is going to be a row later on, but now it's I, I of the norms of these HLMs, so the matrix, so the LM coordinate of this matrix is the norm of the uh, HLM uh, function. The L1 norm of these uh, functions, this matrix has rate, uh, spectral, spectral radius less than one, strictly less than one. 
So if you are in this condition, under this condition, then you have a stationary process. Uh, and that's the sort of uh, situation we'll be looking studying. And the, the other constraint we are interested about, uh, because they make sense in, in uh, neuron science, is the case uh, where the HLM, so these uh, interaction functions, uh, have compact support. And we know an upper bound on the support, S, S max. Uh, so that's sort of the context of what I'm, uh, uh, we are interested in. And we are interested in studying, estimating uh, the parameters uh, uh, H and the news, and so just this is just a, a simulation of a two neuron story. So on the right you have the data. So you have neuron one and neuron two. So for each neuron you're observing the, the time of events, and uh, and these these uh, observations have been simulated from uh, these um, hoops processes with the four functions of interaction. So on the left, you ha I have plotted the functions of, of interactions. So you can see the, the, left, the red one is the interaction of two on one, neuron two on neuron one. The black is uh, the self-interaction of neuron one. There is no self-interaction of neuron two because the blue one is zero. And the green is the interaction of neuron one over neuron two. So this, this is the kind of uh, uh, examples that we have looked at. And of course, when you look at the data, when you have a spike, you don't know whether it comes from just uh, the neuron itself or an interaction from somewhere else. The only thing that you observe are the events. And, and you don't uh, know the genealogy of these events. But you want to reconstruct the whole story. So what the aim of the game here is to, uh, it's to be able to estimate the parameters. And the parameters are these news, the constants for each of the neurons, and the interaction functions. In particular, for the neuronal activity, activities, you're interested in estimating when these neuronal functions are null and when they are non-null. That's the kind of things that you're interested about. Uh, so that, there is some literature on that. There, there isn't much. There is a, a really nice paper by uh, Hansen, uh, Patricia Renobore, and Vincent Rivard, which was sort of the starting point of this work, using lasso. So they, they have a dictionary, and they use a lasso estimate to estimate these H functions. There is hardly anything in the Bayesian framework. There is a bit in the parametric uh, estimation. There is no theory. And so we wanted to understand uh, or to sort of work out the fr general framework to be able to say something on uh, asymptotic properties for Bayesian non-parametric procedures on, this mo on these models. So just so the Bayesian inference in this case, so I, rec I recall uh, what's going on. And so you have your parameter theta. And the likelihood, uh, because it's a nice point process still, uh, the likelihood uh, has a closed form. And essentially, this is, a uh, this is a distribution of the observation given whatever happens before zero, times zero. And so these, uh, uh, this has this sort of nice uh, closed form. Uh, it's nice, but the lambdas uh, have a slightly complicated formula. So they are not completely nice. And because you're Bayesian for the next uh, 30 minutes, and so you have a prior on the parameter theta. And the posterior distribution is given by the prior times the likelihood divided by the normalizing constant. And so the posterior distribution is completely what's going to drive the inference. You can do whatever you want from this posterior distribution. And now we are going to, um, what I'm, I'm interested about is trying to understand how it behaves. And in particular, if the time of observations increases, so if t increases, uh, how does it, uh, am I going to learn something? And what am I going to learn and how and what are the important features in the prior that are going to mess or not mess uh, the, the inference. So uh, that's, now I'm taking a frequentist point of view on a Bayesian object, essentially. So I'm, I'm assuming that there is a true parameter theta star that's driving the, that's sort of the generating the process. And I want to make sure that the posterior distribution is going to concentrate around this true parameter. Uh, and not only do I want to do that, but I want to understand at which rate it's going to concentrate. So what's the uh, reason why you, want to, you might want to do so something like that? Uh, apart from being French, one of them is that actually that uh, if you do something like that, then you get often a nice understanding of how the prior acts on the likelihood. What are the important features in your prior that are going to not disappear asymptotically? And they, if they don't disappear asymptotically, then you have to be really careful about them because at finite t, they might be really uh, influential. And it's particularly important because these models are rather complex models and it's hard to understand fully uh, how it's going to, uh, what are the assumptions that you're making when you're choosing a specific type of prior. And so uh, that's what we want to understand. We, are, we want to understand these epsilon t. So what does it mean? Essentially, you're looking at the neighborhoods of the true parameters 
and you're looking at shrinking neighborhoods of the true parameters, and you want to have the, uh, the radius of the neighborhoods go to zero very fast, but not too fast because the, prior, the, probability, the posterior probability of these neighborhoods still has to go to one as t goes to infinity. So it still captures most of the posterior distribution, posterior mass, and, but it's shrinking as fast as possible. So this epsilon t is called the posterior concentration rate. And that's what we are going to study. Ah, oh, thank goodness, there is a nice uh, theory on this posterior concentration rate dating from, a, uh, from papers by Gozal and Van Tovart. And what they did, they essentially, uh, and it's a very elegant and simple proof, and uh, they, they sort of give a, a set of conditions, two set, two, essentially two types of conditions that have to be checked. And if, if these two types of conditions are checked, then you get an epsilon t, which is an upper bound on the posterior concentration rate. And the two types of conditions are, are the following. One is called the kubak laber condition. And the reason it's called like that is because uh, it sort of uh, describes the prior mass of, of kubak laber type of neighborhoods uh, around the true parameter theta star. And so you have, and this condition gives you a balance. So essentially you have to find an epsilon t such that uh, the kubak laber radius uh, of uh, your neighborhood is like epsilon square t, if you divide by t. But the prior mass of this neighborhood is greater than exponential of minus a constant time t epsilon square t. So you, you have a, a bit like a, ba a balance between uh, complexity and precision, essentially, in your prior distributions. So that's the first type of condition. The second type is called a testing condition. And essentially, you, uh, you have to be able to construct tests and what you're testing is you're testing whether theta equals theta star versus the distance between theta and theta star is greater than a constant time of certainty. And these tests, the important thing is that they have second type error, which is exponential. It's exponentially small. So if you have these two types of conditions, then epsilon t is an upper bound on the posterior concentration rate. And that's what you want. And it's quite nice because these two types of conditions are not in simple models, they are fairly standard now, and there is a, like a wide literature on how to, to check them. So the question was, how, do they, how can they be transferred into something much more explicit in the case of uh, hoax processes? And that was sort of the aim of the game here. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, in the case of Hoax processes, um, I recall what are the parameters. Here, theta are these constants nu and the uh, interaction functions m, uh, hlk, for l and k greater than, less than m. And uh, recall that uh, we're assuming that the Hoax processes are stationary. And so, in other words, uh, this uh, i matrix has, becomes, uh, has become a row matrix now. So, uh, the row um, the norm of the spectral norm of rho is strictly less than one, and rho is the matrix made of the norms of these interaction functions. And one norms. And we'll be looking at two distances, one which is more like a technical distance because it's sort of the first one you capture when you look at these kind of things, and it's the uh, L1 norm between the in intensity function, so it's a stochastic distance, it's a, the L1 norm between the lambda t and lambda star t. But of course, it's not explicit in terms of the parameters because it depends on the observations as well. So that's not exactly the kind of uh, distance that you're interested in. And so from this norm, we'll be going to the second norm, which is much more explicit. And this, this is the L1 norm between the parameters nu and h. Uh, and the observations are still, the obs uh, we're observing the, uh, the process between uh, minus s max, which is the, the sort of the support of the, the length of the support of these functions h and uh, capital T. So uh, I give you the general theorem. Um, so th here, what I'm g g giving you are how these uh, two conditions that I described for f that were made in, that were presented in, in the paper of Godard and Van der Waart, how they, can they are transferred in the context of Hooke's processes. So the kubak lever conditions is trans, uh, can be written, or there is a sufficient condition to prove the kubak lever condition, is that instead of looking at this sort of non-explicit non uh, neighborhoods, you can uh, prove the condition by looking at the uh, usual neighborhood in terms of new. So the, the constraint on new is very weak, because if you have a prior on new that absolutely continues with respect to Lebesgue measure, then this is going typically uh, going to be uh, satisfied. And the second condition, which is a more uh, constrained condition because it's the non-parametric one, uh, is saying that you, to look at kubak lever neighborhood, it's enough to look at L2 neighborhoods for the H functions. 
And so, and now that's quite nice because there have been so much, uh, pay, so there have been so much work on these non-parametric uh, results that we have quite a lot of uh, results existing in the literature on, the, on various priors to check these conditions. And I'll go back to a few examples where they are, they are proved. There is one little thing here, which is you're losing a log log t term, which is unusual. Usually you're losing log t term, but here you are. Uh, in the, in, it is, it's just a technical thing, and I'm sure the log log t shouldn't be here, but we just didn't know how to get rid of it. So that's the Quebec Labour condition. The second condition was a testing conditions. And what you can prove, you can construct tests for the D1t, so the sort of stochastic distance. You can construct tests uh, uh, by actually working on individual tests. So that's the technique of LeCam and Birger, uh, where essentially the idea is the following. You're going to split your, sp your, sp your space. So imagine this is uh, your H space, because here essentially we're looking at the, H, uh, the space of the H functions. This is uh, theta star, so the H uh, star functions. And essentially, what you, so what you want to test is you want to test whether theta is equal to theta star against theta is away from theta star. And the way you do that typically is that you construct this test by making the maximum of a lot of little tests. So you're going to uh, uh, split your space into little balls, the complement of your space into little balls here, and you're going to test each time theta star versus I am in this ball. So that makes you quite a few little tests. And then you take the maximum of all these tests. Okay, so, and that's, uh, I'm, I'm going to describe slightly, uh, very quickly, uh, how these tests are constructed. But once you have, uh, and so in other words, uh, writing down what's uh, the condition on the test boils down to essentially uh, counting the number of balls if the tests are properly uh, constructed. And so the testing conditions is written in terms of, as an entropy condition. And so you're going to have the tests if the entropy on the subspace of your parameter space, which is large enough, such as the prior mass of this subspace is almost one. Uh, the, so the entropy of this set uh, has the right uh, increasing order, essentially. So when epsilon t is the radius of the little balls, then the, the log entropy should be smaller than t epsilon squared t. So that's the sort of usual kind of conditions that you find uh, in for density estimation or all that sort of things. So it's quite, it sort of looks very much like uh, the condition you get for density estimation here. And so if you have that, uh, these two types of conditions, so the entropy condition that replaces the test conditions and this uh, L2 uh, prior mass condition that replaces the Quebec labor condition, then uh, you have an epsilon t posterior concentration rate, but this is for the D1t distance. And I recall the D1t distance is, uh, what did I do with that? It's here. The D1t distance is uh, this sort of, uh, Lambda, lambda. The L1 norm between two uh, intensity functions, so it's a stochastic distance uh, over T. Lambda minus lambda prime. And lambda depends on the observations. So it's not exactly an explicit distance on the parameter. And because it's that, actually the technique we had to adapt. I mean, it's not much, huh? but we had to, da to adapt uh, the techniques uh, that were proposed by Gauzal and Van der Waal to stochastic distances. And it's a bit funny, but it's nothing really uh, much there. And so uh, that's what I said. This slide is awful, but um, that's what I said before. The L2 uh, neighborhood condition really replaces, uh, is here to prove the Kullback Labour condition. And the tests are typical L1 tests except that you don't have densities, so the integral of the lambdas are not, is not equal to one. And so because you don't have densities, you adapt a little bit, but it's there are typical L1 tests. And so when you have these tests here, then you can have this sort of uh, first type error, which is uh, exponentially small. They are individual tests. I'm taking theta equals theta star versus theta is a neighborhood of theta one for a given theta one. And so the test depends on theta one. And the second type error here is slightly different because uh, the in, uh, I cannot say that theta is away from theta star outside the expectation because the distance that measuring the, between theta and theta star is de data dependent. And so uh, I'm expressing the fact that theta is uh, away from theta star inside the expectation. So that's uh, just a sort of a, uh, different, different uh, unusual way of writing things. But once you have that, then you have uh, the test story. 
So just an example of prior, a very simple example of prior, and this is the example of prior that, you've used, that we have used for simulations because for the neuronal activity it sort of makes sense. So we're looking, we're going to um, write on, look at uh, uh, models on the whole parameters that are, you put a prior on the news, which has density with respect to label measures, so there are ID and all that. So the P nu is the density on the news, and then we put a prior on the H, and because uh, we want to make sure that we are in a stationary uh, context, so we are going to split the prior on the H by putting a prior on the rows, which is the matrix of the norms of the H, and then we look at the normalized version of the H, which are then, in this case, density estimations, densities. So, uh, so we have a prior on the rows, and, and whatever it is, and now we, look, we are constructing and we a pri different, various, vari different priors for the densities, probability densities, edge bar KL. Uh, so one possibility, the first simple possibility is to look at piecewise constant function uh, densities, like histograms. So we'll, we've looked at a, a prior based on random histograms and you have two different ways of doing it. Either you have regular grids or you have irregular grids and you put a prior also on the grid. And the second is actually much better than the first in practice. But in theory, you don't see the difference. And it's actually slightly harder with the second. So here, uh, so what does it mean? So I'm looking at densities that are typically going to be piecewise constant with JPCs. And of course, I don't want to choose J. So I'm going to put a prior on the number of uh, grids in, in my discretization. And uh, given the J, then I'm going to, uh, for each of the segments, I'm going to say whether it's going to be zero or non-zero, because I want to allow for zeros. So, so I'm going to choose zero or non-zero randomly with a, a half, probability of half, but it can be anything. Uh, and once it's non-zero, then I look at the non-zero uh, values in my segments. And uh, for instance, uh, what I know is that the sum of the WGs for the non-zero is equal to one. So I can put, for instance, a Dirichet process, a Dirichet distribution on these non-zeros. So this is a very simple, a basic prior. And it's, a, it's a, sort of a basic model in the sense that you approximate in function by piecewise constant functions. Uh, so once you have that, so, so you can make a random uh, histograms with random partition or fixed partition. It doesn't uh, make a difference. Well, at the end of the day, what you get is that if the functions h bar star kl are Helder beta, then uh, with beta less than one, then the posterior concentration rate is going to be like t over log t plus uh, times this uh, log log t term to the power minus beta over two beta plus two n. So up to the log log t term you have the usual rate for estimation, holder functions for uh, the same as what you'd get in density estimation. So you have the, exactly the same uh, behavior. So we don't have a lower bound for these Hox processes, but it's sort of to be expected that this is a lower bound up to the log, log, log t term here. So it's uh, nice, but of course, with this piecewise constant function, you cannot uh, approximate smooth functions, like very smooth functions, because they are piecewise constant. And so another possibility, is to look at mixtures of betas. So, so it's, a, it's based on a, a work I did uh, some years ago on mixtures of betas for density estimation. And the idea is the following. Here, um, for, for some reason, I'm going to look at mixtures of betas, but the mixing is not a probability distribution. The mixing is a sign measure, is a bounded sign measure. And I'm looking at uh, my, my function are going to be the positive parts of these uh, mixing mixtures of betas with assigned measures. And the reason I'm looking at something like that is because I want to allow for zero segments. I want to allow for zeros on, on intervals. Uh, because uh, for the neuronal, neuronal activities, it's really the kind of thing that you're interested about. And so uh, what you can, what's funny about these mixtures of betas is that uh, depending on the way you parameterize your beta, you can have very uh, different behavior for approximating smooth functions. And there is one parameterization that's very efficient, let's put it that way. So, and this, it's an unusual parameterization, and it's uh, based on the one that I've written on the right. Epsilon in my parameterization is still the location, so it's the mean of your beta. And the variance for the, under this parameterization is epsilon times one minus epsilon over alpha. The usual location scale parameterization of betas is usually alpha epsilon times uh, or alpha one minus epsilon. That's sort of the usual one. If you do that, then you're not going to be good near the boundary for approximating functions. So you have boundary effects. 
So if you want to get rid of these boundary effects, you have to have this parameterization. And then you make a location mixtures of these betas under this parameter emission. So you're mixing only over the epsilon here. And I've, I've plotted here two, uh, two types of graphs. graphs. The first is uh, when you're, I'm using this parameterization. And this one is when I'm using the usual parameterization. So I'm mixing over betas with parameters epsilon uh, alpha or alpha 1 minus epsilon. So here it's not mixtures, but I'm just plotting the betas for different values of alphas. And so what you can see is that when alpha gets large, so here you can't see what the alphas are, but they are. So the, the black is 1, the red is 10, and the blue is 50. Um, as alpha gets larger, you have more and more a spike, and it looks more and more like a Gaussian random variable. And what's nice is that here, because of this parameterization, this uh, Gaussian approximation of your beta is good even close to the boundary. It's not only good uh, in the center, it's also close to the boundary. Whereas if you do the other one, then it's, it's fine when you get outside of the boundary, but on, if epsilon is very small, then you, it takes quite a lot of time to catch up and, and actually uh, get a good approximation by a, mixture, uh, by a Gaussian. And that's sort of uh, the, the Gaussian approximation of these betas when alpha is large that allows to have a good approximation of her dot density, her dot functions. And so what you can prove is that uh, for any Hulder function f, you can find a f1, a mixing function f1, which can be negative, such that so the mixture g alpha f1, so you're mixing with f1 this time, uh, is close to f with the order alpha to the power minus beta over 2 in subnorm. And once you have the results, then it's easy to go from this continuous mixture to a discrete mixture, g alpha p, with the same rate. And the thing is, uh, is that the number of components that you need in your, in your discrete mixture is of order square root of alpha up to a log alpha term. And then uh, once you know these results, then the whole story is going to through. And so you just have to put a prior on discrete mixtures with sign measures p. And so what you do is you select the number of components like a poisson, for instance. You select the weights, the, uh, the absolute values of the weights uh, with a Dirichlet distribution. For instance, I've written alpha over j because it looks like a Dirichlet processes, but you don't have to do that. You can be more flexible. And then you put a prior on square root alpha of alpha because square root of one over square root of alpha is really like the bandwidth in kernel estimation. So uh, you want to learn it. You don't want to assume it. And so you put a prior on square root of alpha saying that square root of alpha is gamma. And then you choose the sign of the weights because I don't want to have a positive mixing. I want to have a sign measure of the mixing which is like uh, a rado macker random variable. And then uh, once you have that, you can prove that the posterior concentration rate is going to be adaptive over the whole range of beta. So for whatever beta strictly positive, you're going to have a concentration rate which is going to be of order t to the power minus beta over 2 beta plus 1, the usual one, up to a log t term. So that's uh, for the theory. Uh, but all these results are to get concentration rates in terms of the D1 measure, D1 metrics. But this D1 metrics is a uh, stochastic and it's not very explicit, so it's not enough for, it's not very convincing. And so one of the technical parts of this work is essentially to be able to go from D1 to L1. And there is no bound, like uh, you cannot bound it uh, almost surely or whatever. And so uh, you have to work a little more. And to work a little more, that means we had to add another assumption on the prior. And the, to be able to bond the two, you need to sort of make sure that you're really not stationary. And so you had to put a prior that sort of forbids to be close to the non-stationary part. In other words, you need to make sure that the prior mass of the matrix, the spectral, spectral radius, spectral, spectral radius, whatever, uh, of the matrix row is close to one is very small, exponentially small. So that's a sort of strong prior condition on the matrix row. And then when you have that, the rate that you got from the uh, D1T uh, distance is also valid for the L1 distance. And the way you do that, so I'm not going to give you the, the details of the proof, but uh, it's just uh, a simple trick. And it's, uh, it's related to the fact that when you look at uh, whatever you want to prove, in Bayesian analysis, and when you want to study the posterior concentration rate, so if you want to prove that this, this guy goes to zero, what you do is uh, you write it like that. So you, you, write, you express this quantity 
as a numerator over a denominator. And the aim of the game is to prove that the denominator here is not too small and the numerator is not too large. And so the dt is the denominator. The Quebec labor conditions is here to prove that the denominator is not too small. And so here, uh, we, because of what we did before, we know that the, the denominator is not too small, so you, you bond the prior mass of the denominator. And once the denominator is greater than exponential of minus ct uh, epsilon t squared, I can replace by the lower bound. And then I use Fubini arguments to say that uh, uh, then you have to control the prior mass, the, pr the probability under each theta that the distance is small in, L, in d1t, but the l1 distance is large. And so, uh, and, one, uh, and that's technical, but that can be done. And once you have that, then you have uh, the L1 concentration rate. And so, the, the sort of that's the end of the story. So, for frequentist persons, when you have these posterior concentration rates, among other things, one of the things that you can ha have is the fact that uh, you have estimators that converges at the, uh, at the rate uh, epsilon t, the same rate, under L1, under the same risk here. And what's nice about uh, this result is the fact that the conditions that we have on the prior are very, uh, are the usual conditions. They are essentially the same as if you were working on density estimation. And this has been studied for many, many families of priors. And so it gives quite a lot, large uh, flexibility for the dictionary or your, uh, like you can think of a prior as some putting the prior on the dictionary for the kind of family of dictionary that you can consider to construct your estimators. Compared to what happened when uh, on, uh, in the paper of Hansen and Al, they had a strong condition there and uh, that, that was very restrictive for the kind of dictionary they could consider. So that's for the moment the nice part. And I'm going to give you some simulations quickly. I don't know how long, how much time? Uh, four minutes. Okay. Okay. No, four. Let's put it that way. So, so the simulations, I'm going to, to show just two, uh, two things. <laughs> one is the, if you have two neurons, and one is uh, the very high dimension when you have eight neurons. That's sort of the end of, the <laughs> of our computational skills. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Uh, and so uh, in the two neuron story, so you have eight, so four functions. And they are the ones I plotted at the beginning. So they are piecewise constant and they are non-zero on small intervals. They are not the same intervals for the, each of the functions. So they are exactly the same. That's the example I plotted at the beginning. And uh, the eighth uh, neuron story, what I've plotted is the graph of interactions. I've always wanted to put graphs in my life, so it's the first. Uh, so this is uh, the graph of interactions. And so the fourth neuron is alone, is not interacting with anybody. Uh, not even with himself, so it just have it's like a homogeneous Poisson process for the fourth neuron, and the other ones. Are, so you can see the last one. So the other ones are interacting within within each other like that. So you have connected the components here. And so here is the result, and the prior is essentially the, pri the piecewise constant function I described before. Ah, ah, okay. So here I've plotted uh, the, posterior, uh, the posterior distributions on the mu's, on the new, so the constants, and also uh, the behavior of the frequentist estimator, so the posterior expect no, the Bayesian estimator, the posterior expectation of the news. So on the right, you have uh, 25 replicates of our simulation studies over different 20, 25 replicates of the data sets. And this is a histogram, so I mean the smooth histograms of the estimators for the new, so new one at the top, new two at the bottom. And the colors different from two to three, values, three different values of t. So they are, not, they are not very large. It's t equals five for the blue, red, uh, the green is t equals 20, t equals 10, and then the red is t equals 20. And here uh, on the left, you have the poster, uh, the poster distribution on the news. And so what you can see uh, is really that the, you, you, you do see a concentration, it's a slow concentration, on the news uh, as t increases, uh, both for the posterior distribution here and also for the estimators, which is the result I, I gave as a consequence of the posterior concentration rate. So the estimators are also converging. It's a, it doesn't look like a very quick convergence, but it's, it's converging. And the same with the H's. Uh, so on the left, you have the case where you have a fixed grid. So it's a regular grid. It's a random histogram on a regular grid. And on the right, it's a non-irregular grid. So the partitions are random as well. And of course, uh, the, uh, the random partitions uh, behave much better than the fixed partition. 
because the fish partition is, is much more irregular and so it, it, you need a t, t, t equals 20 to actually catch up with the right functions, which is not too, big, too bad, huh? t equals 20 is not a large number. Uh, whereas uh, for the regular grid, even with a very small number t, you get a very good result. I mean, we use piecewise constant function, so if we had bad results with piecewise constant function, it would have been a really bad sign, let's put it that way. But here, so it just works fine, which is uh, sat satisfying. Now with k equals eight, so the large p story, uh, so, we, so we have eight neurons and that means uh, eight squared uh, functions to estimate, uh, plus eight uh, parameters. So here are the news, so this, these are the posterior distributions on the news for t equals 10 and t equals 20. So again, it's a still a small uh, horizon, you, do, you don't look uh, very far away, so it's not exactly asymptotic. Uh, and so we see that it's quite wide, it's, it's, it's harder to estimate when k equals eight, I mean, it's not surprising, for when k equals eight and k, k equals two. But what's more interesting is that uh, um, you get a very good estimation on the graph of interactions because we allow the, all the functions to be zero or non-zero uh, randomly. So you can, say you, have, you can have a zero. And so these plots, uh, actually you saw even less here than there, so it's even better for me. But uh, these plots uh, show you um, the, pro pro the posterior probability that you have a, a non-interaction for each of the lines. And the thickness of the lines is proportional to this posterior probability. So delta uh, equals one means that there is a link between uh, these neural LK. So it means that the HK, HLK is non-zero. And so here, uh, what happens is that when T equals 10, even when T equals 10, you almost get a perfect uh, interaction graph. That's on the left, and when T equals 10 to 20, you don't see at all these, uh, uh, these lines when they don't exist. And so you are able to estimate very precisely the uh, interaction graph with these sort of uh, simple models, which was quite, uh, quite pleasant. Uh, and that's uh, something, I'm not quite sure. The, uh, that's the same with repeated data. Uh, and that's for the estimation of the, of the H function. So again, uh, piecewise with random grid at the top, at the on the left, and uh, no, fixed grid on the left, random grid on the right, and the fixed grid is not behaving as, as well as the fixed grid, as the random grid, sorry. And the random grid is behaving well, but again, uh, we are in the favorable situation where we are estimating piecewise constant function by piecewise constant function, so life shouldn't be too hard, let's put it that way. So just to conclude, uh, so now we have the sort of theory for L1 consistent concentration for uh, Hoax processes almost com complete, almost complete in the sense that uh, we only deal with positive H functions. So we have this constraint that the H functions are positive. And uh, for the moment, we don't have a story for, the neg the, for cases where H can be negative. The reason you don't have that is that uh, when the function H are positive, these Hoax processes have a very nice representation as cluster processes like uh, Galton-Watson trees, essentially. And so uh, and are, that's very useful to uh, model some kind of short dependence on time. Uh, you don't have this representation when the function h are negative, and so we cannot use this tool to actually be able to <laughs> approximate sums as if the sums were independent, the, the com components in your sum were independent, so it's essentially to uh, be able to grasp the short memory of the process. But somehow, uh, my feeling is that it should be even better because uh, when you have negative h, then you will almost have renewal times. Each time uh, your, your new plus h uh, becomes zero, then you have a renewal. And so you should have even a shorter memory than if you have a positive h, but it's nothing proved here, so it's like hand-waving. Uh, so the, the story needs to be completed with a negative h. There is a big uh, issue here is that, uh, so the simulations on the posterior distribution are based on really basic MCMC algorithm, I mean basic, like traditional MCMC algorithms. So it's reversible jump, so it's, it's uh, la grosse artillerie. I don't know how I say that in English, but it's um, like really uh, heavy things and slow. And so uh, that's why uh, the large P story is like k equals eight. I think we managed to do k equals 10 in a few days. But uh, we are nowhere close to scalable inference in terms of uh, computations, and that really needs to be uh, 
uh, down because uh, these are nice uh, models. And one nice thing about the story here is that uh, the way we wrote the concentration rates uh, is such that we have a really good uh, uh, control on going from D1T to L1, D1T being the statistical distance, L1 being the natural distance. And because of that, uh, there is a good hope that, uh, that we have a good understanding of the frequency properties of predictable regions, at least for some families of prior. So we should be able to understand the behavior, the, the measures of uncertainty, the Bayesian measures of uncertainty from a frequency point of view as well, not only point estimation. But I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Questions? Um, I have two questions. So first, um, I, I guess your theoretical result, they could also extend to the case where k is going to infinity, or so that was the first question. And the second is, can you, do you think you have some results on the um, uh, limiting shape? For instance, in the picture you showed, like, can you, can you show some? Uh, um, in both cases, the answer is I don't know. <laughs> So we didn't look at the case k goes to, uh, goes to infinity. Uh, it's certainly complete. I mean, you could uh, control each of the terms we've controlled uh, with a, a growing of k not too fast. Uh, that's going to be technical, but that's probably feasible. So I guess you can do something like that. That would be like the way to go, I guess. Uh, but certainly the results are only assuming that k is finite and fixed uh, for so far. Uh, for the um, so Bernstein found this result on the parameters. Um, no idea. I mean, I haven't looked at it at all. But it's, uh, yeah, it should be uh, uh, interesting. The thing is that, uh, the, question, the thing is that, uh, I mean, it depends on the applications, uh, of course. But here, uh, the parameters of interest is not really new. And so like the, like the first thing you would like to do on Bernstein found this would be uh, looking at the shape of the distribution on U, because that's the easiest, let's put it that way. But it's not exactly, in, at least for the neuronal uh, um, applications, it's not the parameter of interest. Uh, they don't really care about you. They really care about uh, the shapes of these H functions, when whether there is interactions or not, and when, or what's the length of the interactions, and that sort of things. And so that would be a non-parametric uh, Bernstein-Tronmises. I haven't looked. 